hooray for Hollywood. That's good we bally hooly Hollywood. Where any office boy or young mechanic can be a panic with just a good looking pan. And any shop girl can be a top girl if she pleases the tired businessman. Hooray for Hollywood. You Hello, Hollywood. Welcome to this morning's Walk of Fame ceremony. And a special shout out to our fans who are watching the live video stream presented by our media partner, Variety. I'm Laron Gubler, President and CEO of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, which is presenting today's program. Today we are honoring an award-winning actor, writer, producer, and musician who is best known for his scene-stealing roles in television and film. Today we present the 2,593rd star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame to Hugh Laurie. <laughs> now here to help us kick off our celebration is a member of the Hugh Laurie and Copper Bottom Band. Please welcome Sister Jean McLean. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down All my troubles Will be over When I lay my burden down All my troubles will be over when I lay my troubles down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my troubles down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my troubles down. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sister Jane. You know, uh, we, it is very seldom that we have a musical performance at a Walk of Fame ceremony. And I've got to tell you, that was one of the best I think we've ever had. Thank you, Sister Jane. Now, let me just say, on that note, let me tell you a little bit about our honoree. Hugh was born in Oxford, England, and attended Eton College and Cambridge University, where he received a degree in anthropology. And if you hear anything out there, I know you Brits have to, uh, you know, want to say a little thing when, he, when I say he was born in Oxford, England. You want to cheer a little? All right. So let me just say, we've placed Hugh Star appropriately in front of the Pig and Whistle Pub. You know, this kind of become a tradition for some of uh, his compatriots. Uh, uh, some of the other British actors who have stars here are Emma Thompson. Hugh was here for that one. Colin Firth, Dame Helen Mirren, and many others. All right, now Hugh currently stars as forensic neuropsychiatrist Eldon Chance in Hulu's dra new drama, Chance. And that, in case you missed it, it premiered just last week on October the 19th. He most recently earned his eighth Emmy nomination for his riveting performance of the, on the critically acclaimed AMC miniseries, The Night Manager. 
And Hugh recently reprised his role as Senator Tom James on the last season of HBO's Emmy Award-winning comedy Veep uh, opposite Julia Louis-Dreyfus. <laughs> Hugh previously earned two Golden Globe Awards for his role as Dr. Gregory House on the long-running on the long-running Fox series House. And as you all know, he starred as the acerbic doctor for eight seasons, earning six Emmy nominations and two Screen Actors Guild Awards. While it was on the air, get this, House received a review score of 9.4 out of 10, making it a Guinness World Record holder for most popular TV show. And of course, that made Hugh a record holder for most watched leading man. Now alongside actor Stephen Fry, Hugh first broke into television in 1982 by writing, producing, and starring in The Cellar Tapes. That show propelled the British duo into a number of groundbreaking television shows in the UK, such as A Bit of Fry and Laurie, which Hugh co-wrote for the BBC with Stephen. Hugh's film credits include, and cheer for the ones that are your favorites, they, they include Tomorrowland, <laughs> Mr. Pip, <laughs> Flight of the Phoenix, <laughs> Peter's Friends, <laughs> Sense and Sensibility with Emma Thompson and Kate Winslet, <laughs> Cousin Betty, <laughs> The Man in the Iron Mask, 101 Dalmatians, the Stuart Little movies, and the animated movies Arthur Christmas, Hop, and Monsters vs. Aliens. A talented singer and musician, Hugh has released two albums and performed around the world. Hugh's celebrated New Orleans blues album, Let Them Talk, was released in the U.S. in 2011. A performance documentary about Hugh's musical passion, Hugh's, Hugh Laurie, Let Them Talk, a celebration of New, York, New Orleans blues, also aired on PBS's Great Performances in 2011. He released his second album, Didn't It Rain, with his band, The Copper Bottom Band, in 2013. And let me also say that Hugh is also involved with numerous, uh, numerous charities, including Retrack, War Child, Comic Relief, and Red Nose Day. So with that uh, in mind, please help us welcome to the stage now our honoree, Hugh Laurie. No. So Hugh, you stand here and just wave because we have a few guest speakers who, who have to say a few words in your honor before you get to speak. So let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, he is an, an English actor, screenwriter, author, playwright, journalist, poet, comedian, television presenter, <laughs> film director, and all-round national treasure. <laughs> While in college, he became involved with the Cambridge Footlights, where he met his longtime collaborator and friend, Hugh Laurie. As half of the comic double act, Fry and Laurie, he co-wrote and co-starred in a bit of Fry and Laurie, and took the role of Jeeves, with Hugh playing Wooster in Jeeves and Wooster. He has just begun work on The Great Indoors, a new sitcom for CBS, which is currently recording right here in Los Angeles. Please welcome Hugh's good friend and collaborator, Stephen Fry. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ray. Thank you uh, for coming here for this remarkable day. I have known James Hugh Callum Laurie, if not quite from the egg, certainly uh, for long enough to be able, I think, to say a few words um, about the man, uh, that he is preposterously talented, uh, not just as an actor in all weights, lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight, 
and super heavyweight, uh, but as a musician, novelist, and athlete is beyond dispute that he's um, repulsively handsome and quite intensely blue-eyed is also a matter of public record. But he's also a star, and that's what we're here to celebrate. An ineluctable, ineffable star. But what is a star? I'm a very, um, I'm a very literal-minded person, so I wanted to look up as many attributes of a star as I possibly could. And while the dictionaries and encyclopedias make several and varied claims, uh, they're all agreed on one thing, a heavenly body. I think that's fair. Um, Hugh has exactly that. Um, he's slightly knock-kneed, and um, his nipples are too far apart, but otherwise, <laughs> otherwise almost perfect. Um, what else? A star's life begins, the textbooks tell us, um, in a nebulous, gassy form, which exactly describes the Hugh I first met at university. None gassier, in fact. Um, but the textbooks go on to say the gassy matter will typically accrete into solid and coherent material. At the University Comedy Club that Hugh and I uh, attended a long time ago, when around here all was orange groves and, and donkey fields, um, uh, we, we, um, we saw Hugh writing some material, and, and plenty of it was coherent. He wrote and performed with me, with Emma Thompson, Tilda Swinton and others, uh, and at this point he had to make a decision, for his career thus far had followed two distinct paths. For most of his youth he had heaved on oars in rowing boats as a competitive sport um, to an international standard, hence the knock knees, I think, and perhaps the nipples, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but I know there's a lot of chafing in rowing. So. In his last year as a student, he could either choose to be captain of the university boat club or president of the comedy club. In other words, should he dedicate himself to making people laugh uproariously at the way he pulled himself through the water, or should he consider a career in entertainment? <laughs> he chose the latter, and the world is the richer for it. So this agglomeration of gassy and now solid material grew and grew. And uh, nothing gave me greater pleasure than when he twinned with the magnificent Joe, his wife, and became um, what astrophysicists call a binary system. Um, this is when two bodies, um, and I'm quoting, move around each other in stable orbits. Um, well, relatively stable in his case. Apparently, when the pull between these two bodies is sufficiently intense, matter can stream out and create cloudy globules and clusters. It's pretty disgusting, I know, but that's it's not me, it's Professor uh, deGrasse Tyson speaking. And anyway, these cloudy globules and clusters, um, oscillations and turbulent eruptions, cause the generation between them of three twinkly little stars in the form of human children who are now grown up. According to Wikipedia, an essential quality in a star, and one that Hugh certainly has, is the ability to mix a really wicked martini. Um, I actually added that to uh, Wikipedia. Um, it was almost immediately deleted, along with my right to edit or contribute to that site in perpetuity. But it was worth it. For, for 38 seconds, it did actually say that stars have to be able to mix martinis. And our star continued to mix martinis and to increase in mass and density until he reached the ideal state of balance in which he had enough internal pressure to stop himself collapsing under his own gravity and enough energy to start radiating. And how this new giant radiated, with what luminosity. The story of his achievements has already been told. Uh, there's only one dark spot really over the brilliant surface um, to have been nominated so many times for an Emmy Award <laughs> not to win. But unlike other public figures, much in the news at the moment, who have been nominated for Emmys and not won them. Hugh has chosen not to stamp his tiny jeweled heel and scream foul, <laughs> which is a measure of the man, I think. And so we come here to the epicenter of the entertainment capital of the world, the very eye of the galaxy, where it is the tradition in this marvelous town to reward stars by bringing them right down to earth, so far down to earth, that now Hugh will spend eternity having chewing gum and dog poo trodden into him. 
and very likely worse. The world was at his feet, and now the world's feet are at him. It's now official, then, that he's a star. He has the luminosity, the radiance, the visibility, the martini mixing skills, the enormous gravitational pull that has attracted the whole world, the heavenliness of body, maybe not the knees or the perfectly set nipples. He has all these. He has all that talent and big blue eyes and now concrete recognition in the stones of this sidereal sidewalk. But there are two other qualities that no source that I've consulted tells me are necessary for a star. Nowhere does it say that a star should be filled with wisdom and kindness. And yet above all things, Hugh Laurie is wise and kind. Nowhere does it say either that a star should hide any of its light. But these are lights that Hugh does hide. And I'm happy to bring them out into the open. While he may not be the first kind and wise star to be set in, in, in a paving slab in old Hollywood, I venture to suggest that no star was ever wiser or kinder. And I can say like Dr. Watson of his friend Holmes, the kindest and wisest friend I ever knew. The great Gore Vidal, a lifelong habitué of Musso and Franks just over the road there, once said that every time a friend succeeds, a little part of me dies. <laughs> and I can verify that, but <laughs> while I may curse Hugh Daly for his outrageous talent, his musical gifts, his natural athleticism, his kindness, his wisdom, they all stop me really from resenting him in the smallest degree. On the contrary, along with his extraordinary welcome in this marvelous town and the community that has accepted him with such love and respect, I celebrate and congratulate him from my heart, my dear friend. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Fry. Let me acknowledge the chair of the board of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Fariba Kalantari. Now, our next speaker is an accomplished dramatic and comedic actress, writer, and published author. She is currently shooting a season-long arc opposite Hugh on Chance. She was last seen in a 10-episode arc as David Duchovny's love interest in Californication. And prior to that, she co-starred on the hit CBS series Number. She also received critical acclaim for her series regular role on Rescue Me. Please welcome Diane Farr to the stage. I am so glad that this star is happening. I have the great pleasure of working with Hugh in his new show on Hulu, and on my very first day of work, Hugh Laurie told me he was not an actor. He told me that he won a contest a really long time ago, and that's why he was here doing this job, playing the part of Chance on a TV show called Chance, and he was absolutely sure that someone had made a giant mistake, and it was, quote, only a matter of time until everyone found out that Jeff Goldblum should be playing this part. <laughs> and he was utterly not kidding. On that same first day, he told me he cannot dance, and he is not an artist. He says he's not properly trained at anything to call himself an artist of any kind. This is from a man who I would later find out goes to his trailer between setups to play scales on a piano. Not even like songs, just scales, because he thinks he didn't work quite hard enough as a young musician, you know, despite two of the highest selling blues albums of all time, <laughs> where he plays said piano. And I think really it's just exactly who he is. He wants to go back and do the basics, whether that's the scales or learning all of his lines exactly as they're written before he ever gets to set, because if nothing, he is the most professional person out of his respect for everyone around him. Hugh's the only actor I've ever met who's more worried about other people's time than his own, but of course, this is because he doesn't think he actually belongs on the set. Despite the being the Guinness Book of World Records most watched leading man, I'm sure, in fact, he only agreed to accept the star today on Hollywood Boulevard, because it's right and just that people will be trotting on him forever because that's what Hugh does at work. 
To work with Hugh Laurie is to know he is riddled with imposter syndrome. He's both elegant and awkward and uncomfortable at his job. But please don't take my word for it. If Stephen Fry is his oldest friend, I am his newest. But I thought maybe we should check in with some colleagues of yours over the past two decades who had some other things to say about your self-depreciating rants. Most recently, we have Ethan Supley, who plays his bromance partner on Chance. And Hugh told Ethan, I can't do an American accent. Now, this is not the first person he said this to. Hugh tells everyone he can't do an American accent. But when Hugh drives away from set, sort of like how Superman jumps into a phone booth and comes out as a Cape Crusader, Hugh Laurie enters a Teamsters van and becomes British. It's shocking the first time it happens. It feels like you're playing pirate with him. And when Ethan heard it, he thought he was kidding and really only doing like a moderately good English accent. And then to Dave Mandel, the showrunner of Veep that won Best Comedy this year while he was guesting on it. He told him, I absolutely cannot bear to watch myself on screen. I never do it. Which I know to be true because we once had looping together. And he yelped at the sight of his own face and ran out of the booth. <laughs> but Dave said that they were all so touched at Veep when Hugh showed up for the viewing party for the last episode of the season because he knew exactly what it cost Hugh to sit there and watch himself. But it, brought, it showed the subtle kindness that he brings to the work he does. Then there's Allison Janney who co-starred with you on the film The Oranges. She said you shared a house as a green room together, and in between takes, every time she walked in, there would be this incredible music playing from you sitting at the piano. But when anyone entered, you would immediately stop, throw both your hands up, and say, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Allison felt it was basically universal that everyone sees through this thing you do, and we all know how insanely brilliant and talented you are at anything that you do, and it's your inability to see it that makes you exactly this charming. From Olivia Coleman, your fellow Emmy nominee from The Night Manager, you told her, I've never thrown a party. <laughs> and when Olivia asked you, why the hell not, you said because you didn't think anyone would come. <laughs> if Hugh, Laurie invites you to his house for tea after this, you guys want to come? Yeah. That's what Olivia said. She said everyone would say yes because you're loyal and you're kind and you're lovely and you're funny and you're riddled with self-doubt, which is just so comical to the rest of us. <laughs> then there's Tom Hiddleston, your other stellar co-star and fellow Emmy nominee on The Night Manager, who says you turn around while the camera reloads, you raise your eyes to the sky in an abject humility, curse yourself, and then when he asks if you were right, you would reply, I'm the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time, pine. <laughs> and then you would routinely list the names of other actors to Tom who should have been playing Richard Roper, like Alan Rickman and Jeremy Irons, perhaps even Jeremy Norton, just like you did with me, with Jeff Goldblum and David Duchovny and John Cusack and Mr. Ed the Talking Horse. In fact, Tom was sure that he also heard you say you can't dance, and he remembers you saying that you can no longer do a British accent properly either. <laughs> then Tom went on to add, but I have never worked with a man of such ferocious intelligence and passion coupled with an extraordinary gentleness and deep sensitivity who will cry easily at the sight of courage and at athletic achievement or even the mention of Casablanca. A man with a more acute sense than anyone I know of that rare, old-fashioned, but nevertheless precious thing, honor. And then there's David Shore. David Shore, the creator of House. When his genius met your genius and made you a household name. A man who over eight years together on the most beloved TV show found Hugh to be so capable and good at so many things that they had a running challenge in their writer's room. Who can come up with something that Dr. House has to do that Hugh Laurie won't be able to do? They tried skateboarding, they tried jumping off a balcony, air piano to Baba O'Reilly, and nothing worked. He was such a dedicated professional, he figured out how to do them all. But after eight seasons, every man has a breaking point. And David finally found the one thing you actually can't do. He says you can't beat him at tennis, but he concedes that's because he crippled you with that cane for eight years. But he did share a really long list of things that you do well, no matter how humble you are. 
but everybody's been missing house so much. Maybe it's best if I bring David Shore up here and let him tell you himself just how great Hugh Laurie is. David, would you mind? I'm, I'm supposed to say the nice things about, about Hugh, and um, I, but this is pointless. It is pointless. Um, a skill as Diane said, a skill Hugh has truly taken an almost super, to an almost superhuman level is humility and self-effacement. When you pay Hugh a compliment, all he will take from that, the only thing he will take from that is you are a nice person and nice people say nice things to less nice people. <laughs> if you can somehow convince him that you're genuine, and this is the risk I'm running today, but if you can somehow convince him that you're genuine in your praise, he will simply lose a little respect for you. <laughs> Hugh, the reality is, I'm not a nice person. I'm not English. I'm a bad Canadian. I didn't drive through LA traffic into a tourist hotbed in the middle of the day to be nice. I came here to say, you know how offensive this humility thing is? Every time you say you're some jackass who got lucky, everybody else on the planet has to ask themselves, well, where the hell does that leave me? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, you are wrong. You are, whether you are willing to accept it or not, the funniest, the smartest, most insightful and passionate person, and the most professional and talented actor I have had the pleasure to call my friend. You, yes. Yeah. You touched millions of lives and you changed mine. Thank you and congratulations. And please try to enjoy this. <laughs> Thank you, David and Diane. So Hugh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce administers the walk on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, they actually own the real estate. And I'm very pleased to present you with a certificate on behalf of the city uh, that you, I understand if you put this in your rear window, when you're in Los Angeles, you won't get any parking tickets. But I can't vouch for that. So on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, please accept this award. Now, now that's posing. Usually we don't get that, uh, that uh, good of, a, uh, of posing for us on that. So it's time now to hear from you, Hugh, but let me just say by way of final introduction uh, that we hereby are honored to p declare this Hugh Laurie Day in Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gubler. Thank you for, uh, my God. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm puzzled by how uh, everybody who got up here was able to um, just deposit uh, pages and pages of beautifully written. Uh, sp I don't have any of that. Uh, my, the mail didn't arrive this morning, so I don't have anything. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a moment of silence to absorb this extraordinary thing. It's it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, well, why, thank you. Um, um, I've got to stop myself from doing this sort of Hillary Clinton thing, picking people out. Um, uh, this really, in, in spite of David's remarks, this, we have to acknowledge, is not... It's not a fair world. It isn't a fair world. And uh, my confession is that I have lived a life, I'm 57 now, and I've lived a life of uh, uh, just extraordinary good fortune from start to finish. So much so that I actually 
almost every day I'm anticipating the piano falling on my head to uh, redress the balance. I, I was born into a family that loved me. Um, at least if they didn't, they concealed it well enough. Um, I had extraordinary opportunities, met extraordinary people, um, without whom I would not be standing here, and without some of whom I wouldn't even be standing anywhere. Um, I was uh, incredibly lucky. I have been incredibly lucky. This, as I say, is not a fair world. Uh, but there's nothing I could do about that this morning. Uh, so I'm, if you don't mind, I'm just going to bask. I'm going to bask uh, in, my, uh, in the, this extraordinary honor and my extraordinary good luck. Uh, and I'll, I will set to work first thing tomorrow on the uh, global unfairness problem. Uh, I don't know if you Yanks fully understand what this means to someone who was born and raised 5,000 miles away from here, who for the first 30 years of his life only, only knew anything of this country because of the records I, I listened to and the films I saw and the television shows I watched. That's all I knew. Um, the reach of American entertainment, the power of American entertainment is just uh, is awesome. Power, of course, now seems like a, a rather sinister word. We only ever use it in a rather sinister context. But actually, this is a benevolent power. This is a wonderful power that fills the world with stories and characters and ideas uh, that have an extraordinary effect. Of course, you make great things as well. You invent great things. The martini. I mean, that is, it's a sonnet in a glass. Um, pizza, excellent. Absolutely first rate. Uh, jeans. I'm less sure about, but um, I understand they're very popular. But uh, the rest of the world craves and covets and consumes these things because, largely because they've seen them in entertainment. That's the lens through which the rest of the world sees these things. I enjoy pizza because Louis C.K. eats pizza at the beginning of every show, every week. Um, I love martinis partly because Frank Sinatra uh, drank martinis. I, um, I don't wear jeans. Partly because I saw Mitt Romney wearing jeans once, and then... But this is an, this is an extraordinary power. Uh, I, I don't think there's an actor alive who hasn't felt at some point, some of them quite regularly, that what they do in the business they're in is at some level slightly silly. It can feel silly, it can feel ephemeral and a, a candy floss of no consequence. But there are other times when you are confronted with a realization of what an honor it is, what a privilege it is to be part of something that touches so many lives around the world uh, and even shapes lives. You may say that's a bold claim, but I uh, just consider this. I have lost count of the number of times, um, the number of young people I've met who are either studying or practicing medicine because they saw house. For example, there are physicians today saving lives and delivering babies and lancing boils because their, their imagination was ignited by stories and ideas and possibilities that they might not otherwise have considered. And they see this and they are touched by it. And that's an incredible honor. It's an incredible privilege to be part of this, to be part of Hollywood. Uh, and I use the word Hollywood to mean, I think that's a synecdoche, isn't it? Thank you. That's why, that's why he's here. To, advise me on my rhetorical terms, um, as, as a synecdoche for the whole uh, wonderful industry of entertainment that has just, uh, that has sort of fed the world. And the world is grateful. I'm speaking on behalf of the world now, um, which oddly enough, I am authorized to do. Um, so the world thanks you and I thank you. I thank uh, Mr. Gubler, the, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, uh, the city of Hollywood, the city of Los Angeles, and the United States of America. And it feels, it feels very good to say that. I, Sister Jean McLean, I thank for that, those beautiful, that beautiful uh, tune that she sang, which you from, by the way, you must, all of you, immediately go from here to an, a record store. There are no record stores. You know what I mean. Requiem for a heavyweight. You must buy this and you must listen to it every, every day. It will improve your lives. Diane Farr, my, uh, my ex-wife on chance, uh, with whom uh, we, re well, we remain on good terms, which is, uh, <laughs> which, which is fantastic. And, and of course, um, my colleague, Stephen Fry, who appears by kind permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Um, 
Thursdays at 8.30, I think I'm right. Yes, yeah, good. Um, but, but most of all, I would like to thank all of you for turning up on this beautiful day and for bearing witness to this extraordinary, humbling, and wonderful experience uh, to be part of this city, to be part of this business, to be, to be as lucky as I am. It, it's just, it's frankly overwhelming. And uh, I thank you all, and I hope you all have a wonderful, yeah, dot, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's unveil the star. Do I live this here? Hello. 
Oh, don't mind us. Q, straight ahead. And come here for it, please. Guys, everyone straight ahead. There we go. Straight ahead. Thank you. 